Um, so before we start, is anybody using B hat? Okay, cool. Is anyone using PHP spec? Nice, thank you. Is anyone using PHP unit? Good. Um, so what I want to talk about today is this idea of driving design through examples. So we have a lot of different talks about test-driven development, testing, that kind of thing. What I want to focus on today is the way that we use testing to make good design, which Casper talked about earlier. I think that's what Casper talked about. Uh, I can only read the slides, so it looked like that's what he was talking about. And it's a particular process that um, we've started using for some projects, not all projects, where we let the entirety of our object model be dictated by the conversations we've had with the customers. That's the overview. And we'll go through the different steps. So the term my colleague, uh, Constantine, came up with is modeling by example. I kind of helped him come up with this title. I didn't like this one. It's all about combining BDD concepts with DDD concepts. And it's good because it's not called something DDD. It's, a, it's got a good name. It's not just an acronym. So to talk about modeling by example, we have to first talk about BDD and talk about DDD. Uh, and it, in particular, the specific practices from those two worlds that modeling by example tries to bring together. So BDD is behavior-driven development. Um, it's quite hard to define what BDD is. Dan North has a definition that's about three paragraphs long and has every buzzword you've ever heard in it. But the idea really behind behavior-driven development is to think about your system first from the outside, which is a very common concept, not just from BDD. It's to start by talking to a stakeholder about what should the system do. And BDD is a whole set of practices, and they help at different levels. It's a multi-level approach. BDD techniques can help you build things well. This is when we focus BDD approaches at the very low level individual classes. And at that le level, it looks a lot like test-driven development. BDD came from this world of test-driven development. So often the first thing you want to focus on it, as a developer in your career is learning how to build things well. Learning the tools, learning the best, best design approaches, the best patterns. Uh, as a developer, the next thing you kind of need to focus on as you grow through your career is building the right things. You can build something really well, but it's not what the customer wanted. It's not what you were asked for. So BDD has a whole set of practices to help with this as well. And then a very senior developer thing to do is build things for the right reason. This is, uh, instead of just building what the customer asks for, working with a customer to understand their business and suggest things that they might want to try, suggest alternatives. And again, BDD is a, a whole set of practices for dealing with that kind of thing. But we're going to focus on these first two, building things well, designing the code well, and making sure that the thing we're building is the thing the customer wants. So making sure that we've communicated well with the business side of, even if it's not a client agency relationship, even if it's not a customer in the traditional sense, we want to make sure that the business side of our team are describing well to the development side of our team what they want, what will work for our business, and the development side of the team are delivering that without an awkward conversation at the end where we say, that's not what I wanted. Don't you remember I sent you an email last Tuesday that said it had to be green? All that boring stuff. So the best definition of BDD, especially to focus on these subjects, is Liz Keogh's definition. It's the art of using examples in a conversation to illustrate a behavior, which sounds very simple, uh, but it's something that a lot of development teams don't do. They don't talk about the behavior of the system. They talk about what color the button should be. They don't talk about, they don't give examples. They try and 
figure out what the rules of the system are. And there's a problem when you try and communicate using rules. Um, in fact, when you try and communicate using rules, everyone starts talking about examples immediately. So I'll explain the difference between the two. These are rules, and I'll use this as example as we go through the talk. These are the kind of things a business-oriented person comes up with if they think they have to talk to a developer. So they're trying to write algorithms for you because they think that's what they think that's the language that a developer speaks. So we're going to start a new budget airline ha, flying between London and somewhere else. Uh, I, I had it as Manchester and I decided to change it to Warsaw, but I think maybe I didn't change it in all the places, so it might revert back to Manchester in the later slides. And, and the business might come with some rules. So you're sitting having a conversation, explain the new pricing model for our airline. Uh, travelers will collect one point for every pound they spend on a flight. A hundred points can be redeemed for ten pounds off a flight. So once you've saved some points, you can spend them on a future flight. And by the way, flights are taxed at 20%. Now the problem with rules, these are rules. They're abstract. It's like they're writing some code for you. It's the kind of thing you put in an Excel spreadsheet. There are some ambiguities in here. Can anyone see any ambiguity? Any misunderstandings you might have? Yeah, does the tax apply to the, the price afterwards or is it inclusive of tax? That's a good question. Depends which country you're in, there are different laws. The business will think that's really obvious. The customer will think that's really obvious and if you do it wrong, they'll think you're stupid. <laughs> but really what's happened is you haven't communicated. There are lots of other gaps in here. Rules are inherently ambiguous because they don't have any like concrete examples in them. So questions I might have. Do I still earn points on flights that I spend points on? It's a good question to ask, but the business might not think to mention it to you. To an airline person, it's obvious you don't earn points on redemption flights. That's, what, that's standard in their industry, but the developer might not know that. We mentioned that I can redeem 100 points for £10 off, but can I redeem 200 points for £20 off? We haven't talked about it. There's a, there's a gap. When I pay the tax and I've used some points to lower the price, is the tax on the original price or is it on the lower price I'm paying because I got money off for points? And all of these things, um, all of these things are missing when you just talk about rules. When you try and, when the business tries to write the code for you because the model in their head is different to the model in your head. The assumptions they make about their industry are going to be completely different to the assumptions you make about their industry because you're less familiar. And we use examples in BDD as a very powerful tool for getting rid of this ambiguity. The examples will make it unambiguous. When you're looking at rules like this and you're having a conversation with a business, you will find that you naturally start talking in examples. When you're talking to the customer and you've written this down, you'll say, so what should happen, if, for instance, if the flight costs £50? Does that mean it will cost £40 if I redeem 100 points? You will start talking in examples naturally. You just won't write them down. Because it's a very easy way to understand things, asking for examples. So here are some examples illustrating the same rules. So we, we go through this with the customer. So if you pay cash... I'll pay the £50 plus £10 tax. That removes your ambiguity about the tax. And I'll earn 50 points. It's very explicit how many points I'm going to be earning. It doesn't take long to generate that example. But then you write it down. It's very obvious how the system's supposed to work. If I pay entirely with points, it'll cost 500 points. I'll pay £10 tax still. And I won't earn any new points. And if I just pay with 100 points, 
it'll cost 100 points, and I'll still pay the 10 pounds tax. So the questions we had about how does tax work are kind of disappearing. It's quite quick to get three examples like this in a conversation with a customer, and then record them somewhere. And after you've built the software, how are we going to know if you've built the pricing system correctly? We've used these as a way to understand the system, but they immediately tr map directly to tests because these are objectively testable. If I build a pricing system and I try and buy a flight that costs 50 pounds and the system asks me, please pay 10 pounds tax and please pay, a, and you've earned 50 points, then I know I've built it correctly. So as a developer, I'm a lot more confident that I understood the requirements. If you have a separate testing team, you can give these ex examples they can form the basis of test scripts. If you're doing automated testing, this immediately becomes the basis of some test scripts. All right, so far? Cool. So they're objectively testable. That's the key thing about examples. It's just, it's looking at the same, it's the same, same conversation with the stakeholder, but you're attacking it from a different angle. Instead of saying, Mr. Businessman, you're going to tell me the rules, and then I'll build it. Saying, so give me an example. What would happen if the, in this case? What would happen if I tried to pay with more than 100 points? So because we probably want to use these examples to drive an automation tool, we could just write them down in a natural language like this. I use English. Um, give them to a human and get the human to click through the website and check that all those cases pass. But that's cruel. It's inhumane. Um, I think it's uh, Uncle Bob Martin says, you, you, it's immoral to ask a human to do something a computer could do. So really what we want is to take these sentences and turn them into automated tests in a simple way. And that's what Gherkin's for. It's called Gherkin because um, the tool it was created for is called Cucumber. I don't know why Cucumber is called Cucumber. It's, it's because Aslak is uh, Norwegian. They like cucumbers. So it's a formal language. You don't have to use it. So Gherkin is very useful if you're going to agree these requirements by talking about examples, and then you're going to write them down in sentences. You might have another way to agree examples with a customer. Uh, if you saw Matthias's talk earlier about event storming, that's a very good way through stickies on a wall to get examples of how the system should behave. Taking that and translating it into sentences maybe doesn't make sense. But Gherkin is probably the industry standard way to capture requirements in the form of examples, in the form of natural language sentences. When I do talks, I always say English and then go, oh, you can use Polish as well. It will work in Polish. So this is an example of some Gherkin. It's a very simple format. It's just a text format fixed space format. You've got a feature at the top, so you have one file for each feature, each piece of functionality in your system. You can put some free text here, so this is a good place to just write some notes. Write down the rules that the customer told you about. They might be useful for other developers to read them, but these aren't part of the automation. The main gist of a Gherkin file is a set of scenarios. So I've got three scenarios to start with. One is that when I pay cash, I get some points. Very simple scenario. One is that I use some of my points to get money off a flight. And another is that I use my points to pay for the entirety of the flight. And that's just three scenarios. I'm sure in a real business, you'd think of lots more edge cases. You'd write a scenario for each one of these edge cases. So the scenario has a series of steps inside it. And there are three steps in a Gherkin scenario. So when you're having a conversation with businesses, don't force them into this formal language. Just have a natural conversation. Try and, try and use examples in the conversation. Make some notes, and then later you can translate it into this stuff. Uh, at the start, you have given. This is what happened in the past. Or what state is the system in? It's better to think about what happened in the past. What happened beforehand that's going to set the context? What action is going to happen? 
I buy a ticket, I pay this much, that kind of thing. Inputs to the system. Then is some outcome. What are we expecting to happen? Well, for the system to be behaving correctly, what should happen next? Okay. Action, input, output, behavior. Given is just why does this when cause this then? Why does this, in, why does this particular input cause this particular output? So if I write out the scenarios that we had in Gherkin, given a flight costs 50 pounds, when I pay with cash, then I should pay 50 pounds for the flight and 10 pounds tax and get 50 points. Redeeming points for discount on a flight. Given a flight costs 50 pounds, when I pay with cash plus 100 points, then I should pay 40 pounds for the tax. I've repeated the 100 points there. <laughs> I'm paying for the flight entirely with points Given a flight costs 50 pounds, when I pay with points only, I should pay nothing for the flight, I should pay 10 pounds tax, I should pay 500 points. So that would be derived from the conversation I had with a stakeholder, and if they're interested, I can show them this file. We say it's business readable or human readable. It is a formal syntax, but you should be able to show it to a human and say, is this what we talked about? Can you just confirm this is what we talked about? Just before I stop. So the important thing to remember with scenarios is it's a collaboration. Who writes them? We use the phrase the three amigos. Um, there has to be someone from the business side in the conversation when you're talking about a feature. If you're doing agile processes, it might be called a product, project, product owner or something like that. Someone who knows the business. Because they're going to sign off, yes, that is, that is the feature that will help our business succeed. You need a development expert. Developers can suggest alternatives. Developers can come up with cool ideas or say there's a way of doing this that will take half the time. You really have to have testers in there. If you don't have people in your company who are QA engineers or um, testers as, as their job title, find someone who's good at asking really awkward questions. Like, but what would happen if it was exactly 100 pounds? What would happen if I tried to overpay in points? They can come up with all these crazy edge cases that you maybe wouldn't, wouldn't think of if you're focusing on the development or the business. When to write the scenarios? Um, yeah, you, you should probably write these scenarios or at least have this conversation before you start working on the feature. If you're being asked to commit to how long it's going to take to do a feature, like someone's going to ask you for an estimate, or you're doing Scrum and someone's going to say how much you're going to get done in the next two weeks, you should probably write, have the conversation before that point. So it's a way of building understanding, and you want to build that understanding before you make some commitment that you're going to achieve it. Um, don't write scenarios too long before, before you start, because everyone will forget that that's what we agreed. Um, it takes effort to have a conversation. There's no point putting that time into writing these scenarios. If it's a feature you might not be doing for six months, you might never do. So again, in an agile process, you do it just before you start work on that feature. And sometimes you have to optimize for when the right people are in the room. Those three people, the testers, someone from the business. Some, it can be quite hard to get to speak to people who understand the business. You need to do it at a point when all those people are going to be gathered together. Ideally, you'll all be sitting together in this awesome, agile paradise. But in reality, you might need to make a meeting to get their time. So once you've got some scenarios, there are some techniques you can use to find new scenarios. A really good question is, what, when would this outcome not be true? So we've got this thing, blah, 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 blah. I, I earn 100 points. You look at that scenario and you say, are there any situations when all these things would happen and I wouldn't earn 100 points? That's a really good question. The, the business expert will say, yes, it's always, you, you'll always earn 100 points. Everyone always earns 100 points. Unless uh, they're a member of staff, because members of staff can't join the points program. And suddenly you've discovered a whole new set of features that 
you hadn't heard about before? Are there any other outcomes? I've paid money and I've paid points. Does something else happen? Well, yes, I probably have to get a ticket as well. Probably some kind of accounting entry needs to be created. Or some kind of notification has to happen. So asking what else needs to happen in this situation? What would happen if, is a, the general tester question, what would happen if I paid the money and then cancelled the credit card transaction? That kind of thing. And does this implementation detail matter? Would you accept an alternative? So if your scenario has an implementation detail like um, and then the, the manager should get an email, you can ask, do they have to get an email? Could they get a letter? Could they get a notification on their iPhone? If the answer is I don't care, take that detail out of the scenario. Just say that the manager gets told or the manager should be informed and defer those technical decisions about how exactly we're going to push the message until later. And the thing to remember with the scenarios is they're not contracts. So you're going to have a conversation with the customer. You're going to talk about all these examples. And inevitably, because people are crazy, a few days later they'll come back to you and say, actually, I've had a better idea. I've changed my mind. And you kind of have to be accepting of that, especially if you're trying to do any kind of agile approach. You have to say, OK, I trust you. I trust that your new idea is better. And I trust that your new idea is going to be better for the business. Let's talk about it. So in brief, scenarios give a shared understanding of a feature. They give you a definition of done. And they also tell you how you're going to test a feature. They lead you towards the automation. So that's the BDD concepts that modeling by example brings in. We talk a little bit about domain-driven design, which is a huge field. There are lots of different practices inside DDD, as there are with BDD. I've just focused in on one particular practice in BDD. So what is domain-driven design? Eric Evans had a nice definition. DDD tackles complexity by focusing the team's attention on knowledge of the domain. It's about tackling complexity. Now, every business that you write software for is probably really complicated. And as programmers, we hate this. We try to look for abstractions and we try and say, well, let's just pretend all that complexity isn't there and we'll build something, system, uh, something simple. The worst example of this is sometimes we pretend that there's no complexity in a whole business and that everything is just loading and saving records from the database with forms. That's the biggest simplification you can make. Uh, in DDD, you try and recognize that businesses are complex, and the way you're going to make successful, maintainable software is by the developers understanding that complexity. The developers actually immersing themselves in the business and trying to understand all of these business details. So the way you're going to make software maintainable and long-lived is for developers to actually, instead of trying to hide complexity in the business, really try and understand it. Try and get from the business owners a, a deep understanding of the business domain that they're operating in. If you're working on a financial package, you should learn a lot about finance. If you're making software for a pet shop, you should learn a lot about how pets operate, how you sell pets. So the point is that in DDD, you want to invest time in understanding the business. It's a good investment for developers to be spending time understanding business. And a key concept from DDD is called the ubiquitous language. The idea is that developers and business people are kind of like different aliens, Mars and Venus, right? They speak different languages. One's talking in binary, the other's talking in dollars. Euros, Lottie. And you've got to come together and collaborate to make something. So the way you speak is very important. So in the ubiquitous language, the idea is that you should try as hard as you can to establish a shared language. So when the developer uses a word, it's the same sense in which a business person would use the word. The point of this is it reduces the cost of translation. When the business says, we need a new line item 
added to the invoice. In some systems, the developer has to take that instruction and then translate, we need a new finance item added to the finance item list repository. Right? There's a translation cost there. If those classes are called invoice and line item in the code, everything's a lot simpler. The developer can explain why a bug happened. It's because the credit note went out after the invoice. And because that's the language financial people speak, they understand much better why things are happening. So you're trying to understand, you're trying to establish terms that the business will understand. It's not just one way. It's not just developers understanding business language. It's about business people trying to understand developer language. Sometimes the developers have to fix the business language because the business, for instance, is using the same word in multiple places to mean different things. You have to disambiguate, come up with a glossary. So the combination of these two approaches leads to modeling by example. So both things are about conversation. We're going to talk about code in a minute. But <laughs> both of these practices are very related to conversation. They're just trying to get different things out of the same conversation. The BDD approach is trying to get examples when you have a conversation to remove ambiguity. In the DDD approach, very often what you're trying to focus on is understanding the business through a conversation. But in both cases, it's about becoming closer and closer to the business you're dealing with. So this is Constantine's um, definition. By embedding ubiquitous language into your scenarios, your scenarios naturally become your domain model. So the idea is that by having an example-driven conversation with a customer, and during that conversation, trying as much as possible to understand the business's use of the language, what terms they're using when they're describing features, we can then take the output of this and use that to directly create our domain model. So the best way to understand the domain, grow that DDD understanding, is to do this BDD practice of asking, asking for examples, steer the conversation towards examples. We're going to write the scenarios in a way that capture ubiquitous language, so they're using the language of the business. We're going to write scenarios that illustrate real situations. That's what an example is. But by having real product names, real prices in the scenarios, it's, it grows everybody's understanding of the product they're building. And then this is what modeling by example adds. We then directly drive the code model from these examples. Uh, in our case, we're going to use BHAT to do that. So the, the people who um, said they were using BHAT, who's using it for uh, testing through the user interface, testing through web browsers? Has everyone gone? Who's using it for directly driving PHP objects? Where's everyone else gone? We lost interest. Not enough B hat. So the way a user interacts with the system is typically you'll have some sort of core domain model. You'll have a user interface and you'll have an in some infrastructure. This is very simplified. You can draw it as a hexagon if you prefer. And the arrows are probably the wrong way around. And depending on your application, this might be a very blurry boundary, and this might be a very blurry boundary. But the way a, a real user is going to be interacting with our system is probably through a web browser. So the way most people use BHAT is to replace the web browser with BHAT and directly drive the entire stack of their application. This is what I've done for years. There are problems with it. It's very slow because it involves making requests to web pages and real databases doing things. And occasionally stuff times out in a mysterious way. The network disappears halfway through. It's very frustrating. It's brittle partly because the user interface changes. Some people say it changes more rapidly than your domain model. But the user interface changes at a different pace to your domain model. The user interface, in a lot of cases, changes more often than your business rules change. And what you find when you're doing UI testing is the front-end developer will change the color of the home page 
and in doing that, remove the class you're basing your integration tests on, and that all of the test suite breaks. It's, it's really annoying. <laughs> And they don't let you think about the code. When you're writing end-to-end -end UI tests, you have to think about user interfaces plus domain model plus persistence. You have to think about the full stack of your application. And you know, you're talented people. I'm sure you can do this. But it's a lot easier just to think about the domain model and not worry about persistence and not worry about the user interface until later. That's how you get a separated domain model, by designing it at a different time to the user interface. So, so what we do when we're doing modeling by example is we ignore the user interface for now. We're going to build it later. We're going to directly drive the domain model through BHAP. Just for one feature, possibly just for one scenario. But, let, but just focus on the objects first and then Focus on the UI. So this is the scenario I showed you earlier. And this is probably a perfectly acceptable scenario for driving UI tests. And a lot of BDD practitioners will stop there. This is good enough. With modeling by example, what we have to do is what we missed when we had that initial conversation was trying to understand the business as much as possible. This is kind of like a CRUD mechanism. We've identified a couple of things. There's a thing called a flight. There's a thing called points. But we haven't really you know, checked, checked with the customer. Is that actually how things work? Is that how you think about the world? So we need to add some detail. We're not going to add implementation detail. We're going to add realistic detail and realistic words from the business domain that the software is going to have to deal with. So I've added some detail. Here I just had a flight. Now I'm adding the detail given a flight from London to Manchester costs 50 pounds. It's not going to add anything to the automation tests. What it's going to add, I could have just said a flight costs 50 pounds, but by putting in a flight from London to Manchester, <laughs> it's not Warsaw anymore. I, I'm illustrating that this is, either developer I'm saying, this is how I understand the system. Flights from London to Manchester cost 50 pounds. Um, when I fly from London to Manchester and I pay with cash, that's an extra detail, I should pay 50 pounds for the flight. So that's added a bit of detail. And then you get, go into a dialogue with the customer. Is this how you name things? Is this what you call it? This is, what I think, this is how I'm thinking about it. How are you thinking about it? What words do you use? Do you call it a flight? Or do you have some crazy industry term to use instead, some acronym probably. Do you, do you say points? Do you say paying? I've said the flight from London to Manchester has a cost. Is that true? Does a flight have a cost? Oh, it's, it's, it's more complicated, right? It's way more complicated. I've, I've had to simplify it for these examples. So I'm going to make it more complicated, but the real airline industry is crazy. Do you call this thing tax? You know, Really, you're asking how you talk. How do you talk about it? And you end up with something. I mean, really, the point is you're listening to what the customer's saying. And you're engaging in a two-way dialogue. You're not just sitting there writing down what they say. And maybe you'll learn these things. The price doesn't belong to the flight. The price belongs to a fare, and the fare is attached to a route, which is way more complicated than I thought it was. A flight is independently assigned to a route, so over time, a fare may become available on a particular route and then stop being available. This is more simple than real airline ticketing. And there's actually a fare listing system whose job it is to tell you right now what's the cheapest fare for this route. But we didn't capture that before. Or maybe it would have been a surprise to us. And I get quoted a cost at the point I purchase a ticket. All of this stuff is really good to know. It's really, really useful. The main reason it's useful is that it means my mental model of our system is going to be similar to the customer's, men customer's mental model. And more importantly, our code model is going to be similar to the customer's mental model. That is incredibly important. 
if those things are not aligned, the customer will ask for a change and the development team will say that's impossible. We'll have to rewrite the whole system because we haven't built it that way. Small, small business changes that seem really simple to the customer, for instance, maybe there are multiple fares that apply to a particular plane, we, we would have missed that. It would have been a difficult change to make. When you have a very aligned model, you're still going to get situations where the customer asks for a change that is a pain to implement, but they know it's going to be difficult to implement, and it's going to be a big business change for them anyway. They're going to have to print some new forms and change the way they do the system in the office as well. So they know when changes are going to be big. So we end up with something like this. Given a flight XX100, we had a conversation about flights. It turns out there's a thing, it turns out flights have an ID. Who knew? Flies the LHR to Man route. I was talking about London to Manchester. But the customer said, actually, there's more than one airport in London. Flights aren't between cities. Flights are between airports. And we have a way to call airports. We have a naming system for airports. We've solved this problem. You don't have to have an auto increment ID for airports. 100 years ago, we came up with a, a unique ID for airports. It's already solved inside the business domain. You find that with any long running business, the older the business is, the more likely it is they've solved all of your modeling problems for you. Some businesses like law, they're centuries old. They've solved all the problems for you. They have a system. And when I'm issued, on a, a, I'm issued a ticket on a flight, so I've learned the word issued, something issues me a ticket, and the ticket relates to the flight, not the route, and I pay 50 pound tick, the ticket should be completely paid, which is a term from the business domain, and the ticket should be worth 50 loyalty points. I put the word loyalty in, I learned that during the conversation. It's a very human thing, just getting this extra detail, and now we can write some code. So now we drive the domain model with bhat. So we've got this feature file on disk. Very simple thing to do. We run some bhat commands. Uh, we set up a configuration. We tell bhat we're going to be using a context called flights context. Context is a class. It's a class that for every step in the scenario tells bhat what PHP code to execute. And when we generate the context through bhat, it looks something like this. For each step, we have a method with a sort of pattern match. I don't know if you guys at the back can see it. Given a flight, something flies the something to something route. And the method itself does nothing. So when I run the tool, it'll, it will complain. It'll say, you haven't written any code. But for each line in the step, the appropriate method in the context class will get executed. When I run bhat, it outputs my scenario in a pretty way, and it gets to that first step, and it says, you haven't written any code. Go and write some code for this step. And this is where I'm going to start modeling my domain. Um, so you start, step by step, writing code that bhat is going to execute when it gets to that step. Now, the system doesn't exist yet, so we're not talking about testing. We're talking about design. We're going to use each step to design our object model that represents this scenario. And the first thing, first sort of pointer is that when you get obvious values in your scenarios, nouns that are just represent some kind of value or identifier, model them as value objects. So given a flight, I've changed the argument to flight number and changed it here as well. I've changed this to origin and destination. Given the flight, flight number flies the origin to destination route. And then I've done my best. You know, you have to use your own design sense, so different people will design this differently. But I've said there's a flight, which is an object called flight, that takes a flight number, flight number from string, and then the flight also takes a route. And the route is between two airports. Okay? None of these objects exist yet. But I'm just trying as directly as possible to read the sentence and trying to remember what 
remember what the context we were talking about was? Remember my understanding of that in my head? And translate it into code. And this is just values. There's no real behavior here yet. I'm just representing these things as values. Uh, Bhat has a shortcut called a transformer that's very useful for value objects. I can get Bhat to do some of the translation for me and simplify it. So transform flight number knows to call this method. So I can say a flight flies the route. This flight number flies from this airport to this destination. Create a flight with that number between the origin and destination. So I'm just modeling values at this point, just trying to represent the concepts from the conversation in my business domain in my domain code. And when I run bhat, nothing happens because these objects don't exist and PHP, until very recently, can't catch fatal errors. But it tells me what to do. Class flight isn't found. So I'd then, I'd then describe the objects with PHP spec. You can use PHP unit. I go on the unit test level and start doing test-driven development. So in PHP spec, I describe the airport like this. It can be represented as a string. If you try and create it with an invalid code, it's going to throw an exception. That's a good thing to do with value objects. Don't let them be created if they're going to be in an invalid state. So if I can give it LHR on its constructor and call as code, it's going to return LHR. If I give it some crazy number that doesn't look like an airport code, it's going to throw an exception. And then I'll run the tool, it'll fail. I'll then create an airport object that looks like this. It's just going to store that data. And it's going to throw exceptions if, if it doesn't look like an airport. And then I do that for all of the objects I just created. And then the first step passes in BHAP. Now, what I've done is I've created four or five objects, all of which represent really meaningful concepts in the domain, concepts that the business is going to be familiar with. So the tool passes this line. It's green, nice green color. But then it fails on the next step. It says you haven't written any code for the next step. The next step is given the currently listed fare for this route is this amount of money. So again, my job is just to take this and write it in code as best I can. Write it as objects. And there's this idea of a currently listed fare. So there's going to be some fare listing service. Now, I don't want to worry too much yet about what that looks like. It's probably going to be complicated. It might be some web service I have to talk to. So that kind of boundary, you represent it as an interface. So you don't create, you don't get too mixed up in it. You just say, there's going to be something called a fare list that knows how to list fares. It's going to know how to give me a fare. I'm going to think about it later. It'll probably be a database or something. I then make a fake version of it, just for my tests. So this is its kind of like a mock, really. It's just going to be a fake implementation that I'm going to use in my testing layer. Later on, when I do end-to-end -end testing, I'll test the whole thing again with the infrastructure in place. So this means, given the currently listed fare, I can make a fake fare list, and I can inject this is the fare that's currently listed. Run bhat. And the first two steps are green. So I'm just working through these early steps, fleshing out a lot of the domain model. I'm generating value objects. I'm generating interfaces for the other systems that I know I'm going to have to connect to later. And I'm not having to do it all up front. I'm doing it by just reading the conversation I had. I did a lot of the work in the room with the customer when we said, well, should it work this way? When I'm issued a ticket on this flight, I translate that into code. I have to come up with some service called a ticket issuer. Something has to issue the ticket. That's not really represented in the domain. When, I, when the ticket issuer that was created with the fare list is asked to issue a ticket on this flight, I'm trying to match it. Issue a ticket on, that tells me what the method should be called, because that's how I spoke to the customer. Same sort of error. I'll write a PHP spec. But this is... Um, it's quite an anemic test. It's just testing that a method can be called. That's because, here's the implementation, and it passes. I go through all the steps, but I don't feel like I'm really writing any logic yet. What I am writing is a lot of value objects. 
What I am achieving is a lot of interfaces. I'm figuring out the naming of my system, but I don't really write any code yet because we're just working through the given and when steps, the context and the action that's being taken. And you'll find you only need, really need to add in behavior when the then steps come in, when consequences start to happen. So I work through my code, and it will be pretty anemic until you get to the then step, until the system actually has to do something. When you get to the then step, you'll find you've modeled a lot of the concepts that you need to deal with. So then, the ticket should be completely paid. I'm going to assert that the ticket is completely paid. It's a pretty simple assertion. There's no method called ticket is completely paid. I then write some specs that describe what, how the ticket object is going to behave in different circumstances. I then have to implement the ticket object. I then find I've had to add some logic to the fair object, which I then have to describe and then construct. I decided to model the fair as an immutable object because it's a value. And then at some point we ask the fare, is the remaining fare zero? So I have to add that method uh, is zero to the fare object to make sure it knows when it's zero. I run B hat and then it fails. This is the first time it fails. And it fails because finally we're saying then this is what should happen and the thing isn't happening. So when you're doing this process and you get a failure at the B hat level, what you need to do is figure out why it's failed and then write unit level tests that reproduce the same error condition. So here I reproduce the exact same condition. When I route between these two airports and I make a flight that's on that route with this ID, when I ask the f and I tell the fare list this route has this price, when I issue a ticket on that flight, the ticket should cost 50 pounds. So the current fare for that route is 50 pounds, that flight's on that route. When I ask the ticket issuer to issue a ticket, it should return a ticket with that fare. This is the same thing that the B hat is testing, but I'm deliberately trying to reproduce it at this lower level of test. And then I have to write some code, but it's not that hard. I've got some tests to show me the way. And I've had to add an extra method to the fare list and add something to the fare list stub. But again, it's helping me understand the interface that the real fare list is going to have later. It's helping me understand what is this boundary going to look like? What contract is the thing that sits on the other side of the boundary going to have to fulfill? And that step passes. Last step is that I check the ticket generated some points. I then decide the fare knows how many points it's worth. The ticket asks the fare how many points are you worth. And this prompts some changes in the ticket for me. And at the end of the whole process, I've got a passing scenario. So just by working step by step through my scenarios, the amount of work for each step to pass is very low. But at each step, I'm getting three or four useful objects that are going to become part of my, my domain model. I'm ensuring that my domain model is very aligned with the conversation I had with the customer, which hopefully means my domain model is very aligned with the model in the customer's head, the business model. So where is the domain model at the end? This, this is your domain model. This is what we've used as our design tool. This is one of the key concepts in modeling by example. As well as UML diagrams being domain models, Conversations can be domain modeling tools. And the specs act as a domain model for your individual objects. Once all this is done, you can think about testing the UI, but it becomes a lot easier. I know I've got a ticket issuing object that issues, tic issues tickets at the right amount. So I move into a different mental phase. I'm now thinking about controllers, I'm thinking about templates, I'm thinking about routing. And at the same time, I'm thinking, how is that UI going to plug into all of those objects I just designed? That UI's job now is just to call methods on my domain layer. 
So when I'm thinking about that UI layer, I'm just thinking about UI. I'm not worrying about all that calculation at the same time. So when the domain's already modeled, you get some other big benefits. The UI tests now don't have to be comprehensive. If I have 40 scenarios testing different combinations of amount paid, points, and the cost of a flight, I don't need to test all of those through the website. Probably if one of them works, it means the website is connected to that domain model. I just need to identify which key scenarios do I now need to retest through the UI. This is where you'll see a huge increase in the speed of your test suite because you're just not testing as much stuff through the user interface anymore. When I'm writing the UX code alongside the UI tests, I'm just focusing on UX. So I'm probably thinking about CSS at the same time, all that thing where you make it a nice website. And the actual UI code is easier to write because I know I've got a whole library with methods I can call that will achieve this behavior. The way you do that in BHAT is you just set up a separate suite in the configuration, and you say this context, the flight's context is the one that drives the objects directly. I'm also going to have a web flights context. The web flights context is going to take the same steps, but instead of calling methods on objects, it's going to drive some browser automation tool. And it says when I buy a ticket, it's going to visit a URL and click a particular button. When I say then the price is 50 pounds, it's going to check that a particular div has a 50 in it. But I say this is only going to run on scenarios that are tagged as UI scenarios. And then in my feature file, I just tag one, one happy path scenario that says this scenario is going to be tested through the UI. If you have particular error handling, you maybe will also tag some of those. So to summarize, the point of modeling by example is it's going to focus your attention on specific use cases. And those use cases are going to be written in business language that the developers understand that the business understands. Everything becomes clearer, communication becomes easier. It helps the developer understand this core business domain. And that is it's something junior developers don't realize they need to do. But as you grow in your career as a developer, you realize, I really just have to start understanding what people want. It's, it automatically encourages a layered architecture because you take this step first of driving the domain model. Uh, for me, this is the biggest thing that has driven my code to be more decoupled. I always tried to write decoupled domain models, but I always used them in the context of a UI. So having something that directly drives that domain model really helps you see where you're breaking those boundaries accidentally sometimes. It does speed up test suites. One of the projects we worked on using this approach, a uh, guy called Carlos, he did a talk about it. And at the end, someone asked, you know, how long does your test suite take to execute? And I know the guy who asked, his company's test suite took two or three hours because they had a lot of UI tests. So he asked Carlo, Carlos, how long does your suite take to execute? And he said it takes, it's quite long. It's like 90 seconds. It's a really long time. So it does have a dramatic effect. You're testing most stuff by driving PHP, which is fast. And then you're driving a small subset later through a user interface. So when to use it? Use it when you need a decoupled core. That's not all the time. Maybe you're working on something that's going to be thrown away in a year. Use it when that domain model is modeling what's core to your business. If you're writing a, if your business is selling um, candy and you're writing a telephone answering system, don't worry about domain modeling. Model the core stuff that differentiate your, differentiates your business from other stuff. Do use it if you think you're going to have to respond to changes in the business later. The more aligned your, your domain model is with the real business model, the more easy it will be when the business model changes to change your domain model. And you have to be able to have conversations with stakeholders. You can try doing this in your offshore development team where you never actually meet the real stakeholders, but it won't be successful. It has to be through real conversations with real people. 
So don't use it when it's not core to the business. It's a new finance system or something. Uh, don't use it if you're writing a prototype. Don't use it in a situation where it, w it will be easier to throw away the system and write a new one than it will be to change stuff. And if you don't have access to business experts, you won't be able to do this process, but try and change that anyway. It's going to change your team for the better. So that's it for me. Thank you. My name's Kieran McNulty.